Amen. Good morning, everyone. I'm Paul Denai, and I'm your MC for this morning session, this first session. Today, I'm going to give you a little overview, introduce our speaker and our respondent. And I want to welcome everybody back here. Apparently, the topics today are even more engaging than yesterday. We're getting more people than yesterday. Not for any of us that were here yesterday to feel diminished in any way, right? Um, but thank you for uh, coming and for your participation. Let me introduce our, our presenter today. This is uh, Joseph K. Gordon, professor of theology at Johnson University in Knoxville, Tennessee. His first book is Divine Scripture and Human Understanding, a Systematic Theology of the Christian Bible. And his articles, essays, poetry, and scientific notes appear in Theological Studies, Nova Evetera, Macrina Magazine, Method Journal of Lonergan Studies, Lonergan Review, and the Herpetological Review. Okay, I think I said that right. And as he's a certified Southern Appalachian naturalist to the Great Smoky Mountains Institute at Tremont and a certified master herpetologist. And through the, oh, through the Amphibian Foundation. And he's currently writing a book about snakes and theology. So uh, read more about his work at josephkgordon.hcommons.org. Welcome, we're really glad to have you. Can we just say thank you for coming? And let me go ahead and introduce our respondent. Felipe Dovale is assistant professor of biblical and systematic theology at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, where he also serves as department chair. He specializes in the area where theological anthropology and moral theology connect. And his work up to this point has been focused on gender. He has a book coming out in November entitled Gender as Love, a Theological Account of Human Identity, Embodied Desire, and Our Social Worlds from Baker Academic. And let's thank our respondent in advance too. So just a reminder that our presenter will present uh, for about a half an hour, and then we will have the response, and, the, and then we'll have open discussion. So prepare your questions. Welcome, Joe. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be uh, in Chicagoland with you all. So if you think the specific topic of the symposium has intrinsic value, that responsible and faithful stewardship of and love for the more than human world is ingredient to Christian discipleship, sanctification, and calling, you've likely asked yourself some version of the following question. How can I persuade Christians to care about the health and flourishing of non-human creatures and their and our common home? For there is no guarantee that Christians do care or will. In fact, many do not. Some may even say, using scripture, that to do so is a waste of time and resources. Today, I would like to explain one strategy I've discovered, which I've found quite effective thus far. Just put a wild non-venomous snake in their hands. <clears throat> my personal history of taking up serpents, which I'll detail later, predates my faith, but it has been significant at key moments in my journey of discipleship, sanctification, and vocation. It has occasioned and even demanded significant theological work from me along the way. So as such, what I present today is intensely personal, but despite its personal nature, it is not unserious. It is a traditioned, intellectual, practical exercise of the theological interpretation of Scripture, and it's profoundly relevant to the topic at hand. Though Lynn White's seminal essay in Science has instigated a lot of fruitful research and dialogue about scriptural testimony and ecological concern, one could still get the impression that the Bible specifically and Christian faith in general are problematic or even obstacles to ecological concern. What help, after all, could an ancient set of generally anthropocentric, plurivocal texts provide for addressing technological, social, and cultural developments that the ancient human authors of Scripture could never have anticipated, let alone fathom? When contemporary issues such as climate change and the history of Christian abuses of the natural world set the agenda for ecological hermeneutics, and when we rightly recognize the historical distance between our world and the worlds out of which scripture was written, the dangers of anachronism and selective proof texting are ever present. 
And even if there are poignant green texts in scripture, those that we can easily use in support of creation care, what should we make of those supposed gray texts, such as the foundational command that humanity is to subdue the earth and have dominion over the animals? What we need is an explicitly theological approach that doesn't restrict the work of engaging scripture to either the pursuit of authorial intention or to just cataloging and repeating what the Bible supposedly says. What's required instead is a self-conscious exercise of scriptural reasoning wherein we take responsibility for identifying and justifying our commitments to what we think God may be teaching us as we engage the sacred page again and again, stewarding the mysteries of God. The following exhibits my own beginning approach to such issues, uh, mostly focusing on the possibilities opened up in the first two creation accounts in Genesis 1 to 3, I'll consider the place of snakes in God's creative and redemptive work to explore notions of the good, doctrines of creation, nature, sin, and grace, our vocation to delight in, love, serve, and know non-human creatures, and eschatology. So scriptural snakematics and outline. When Christians learn of my lifelong love for snakes, they often respond predictably. Haven't you ever read Genesis 3? <laughs> the snake is cursed above all creatures. According to the Proto-Evangelium, Genesis 3, the offspring of Eve will crush the head of the serpent. And Revelation explicitly identifies the devil as a serpent. These seem uh, to damn or curse all snakes. Snake haters happily regularly to me utilize such texts to justify their conviction the only good snake is the dead snake such an approach is cross-culturally ubiquitous but it ignores significant scriptural evidence in fact i suspect it's founded more on prejudice than anything else in barbara brenner's remarkable fictional a snake lover's diary the author narrates a boy's summer-long quest to capture and study his local snake fauna he first has to convince his ophidiophobic mother to allow him to keep specimens in the house. Quote, I asked her where she had got her dislike of snakes, he says. She said from the book of Genesis. I said, I didn't think it was nice of her to use the Bible to back up a prejudice. <laughs> Such a rigid, negative, or prejudiced reading of all actual snakes through appeal to Genesis 3 is already disallowed by the testimony of Genesis 1, the first poetic account of creation. On the sixth day, the same day humanity is created, we read that God made every creeping thing and called them good. That term included snakes in the ancient world and sometimes was even synonymous with them. So, in fact, no snakes are bad snakes. All snakes, as all created things, are good. Though human readers, the only readers of this text, as far as I'm aware, have understandably often skimmed over or even skipped the preceding verses, we ought to pause to consider how these verses contextualize the privileges, commands, and blessings given to humanity on the sixth day. Doing so will provide key context for my account of the goodness of snakes. Modern Western Christians, as you all know, have often appealed to Genesis 1, 26 to 30, to sanction the instrumental use and even wanton destruction of non-human creatures. I regularly hear believers use this text to justify killing snakes trespassing on their property. Whatever it means, though, to have dominion and subdue, that God immediately provides food in 130 for non-human animals suggests the myopia of an exclusively anthropocentric reading of this text. Moreover, if our vocation is to rule creation as God does, which we should expect given that we're created in the image and likeness of God, then the shape of God's rule reflected in Genesis 1 verses 1 to 25 also disallows the use of 1 to 26 to 30 to justify the selfish or even utilitarian denigration, subjugation, and destruction of non-human creation and creatures. God rules creation, after all, by calling creatures into being, by blessing them, by commanding them to fill and flourish, by collaborating with them, and, as I have just mentioned, through providing for them. God does not lord it over creation, crushing it, using it up, and bending it to his will, but instead, 
lets it be, blesses it, and serves it in its flourishing. God intends that the living creatures, the nefesh hayah, with whom we share the breath of life, and the green, mostly stationary creatures upon whose breath our lives depend, should fill the nooks and crannies of the hospitable lands, waters, and skies. The other creatures of Genesis 1, including snakes, give praise and glory to God through their own selving, through living out the particularity of their very existence. A brief detour to consider the achievements of modern scientific taxonomy would fill in this picture profoundly. It is clear that God wants and loves biodiversity. One can make arguments for the goodness of genera and perhaps even for populations of species on the basis of scripture's recognition of the classifications of creatures in Genesis 1 and Adam's naming of the animals in Genesis 2, and also from God's call to Noah to take, to preserve two or seven of each kind upon the ark as if he's some sort of proto-conservationist. But the testimony of other texts ought to persuade us that God loves not just genera or categories or species, but each and every distinct creature, and so each has intrinsic value. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny, our Lord asks the disciples, yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. In the Gospels, it is a principle of faith, when Oberi asserts, that God's love for the world includes every creature individually, not just races or species. Our likeness to God could entail that we have the capacity to recognize, affirm, and love the beauty, goodness, and fruitfulness of biodiverse non-human creatures, not just in general, not just specifically, but even individually, as each heeds God's commands to live out its life. God might make it possible for us even to serve such goods. While some have argued that the earthier Eden creation account of Genesis 2 and 3 balances the strong anthropocentrism of Genesis 1, a careful inquisitive read of Genesis 1 already puts us in our place. The primary distinction we should keep in mind from Genesis 1 is not the creaturely contrast between humans and non-human creatures, but the infinite qualitative distinction between God the creator and creation, and we're on the created side. Creation does not belong to humanity, uh, as Dean Edwards just read, but to God. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. While creation belongs to God, certain biblical witnesses testify that the Lord God of Israel, who we worship, does not, unlike the creature-like deities of her neighbors, need creation or creatures. It's good news that God does not need us, but it is. Last I checked, we are. Why? Because God wants us to be. The goodness in cre of creaturely existence includes also snakes as well. God does not need them, but wants them to be too. Now, the serpent in the garden is clearly problematic, and the serpent of Revelation 22 uh, is not good, I grant. So then we seem to be at an impasse, having identified at least an apparent tension in the biblical testimony about snakes. Are they good as the theologically and canonically informed reading of Genesis 1 suggests, or bad as the accepted common reading of Genesis 3 holds? Does God want them to be or not? I'll return to the Eden account briefly in Revelation eventually, but first I need to discuss some of the other key texts in scripture where snakes are mentioned. Snake terms occur over a hundred times in the Protestant canon. These words, primarily nachash in Hebrew and ophis and echidna in Greek, often serve a negative symbolic purpose. In most cases, the fact that venomous snakes are dangerous, even deadly, serves to convey the seriousness of sin, the reality of deceit, judgment, danger, destruction, fear, and death. Note, for example, John the Baptist and later Jesus calling the Pharisees a brood of vipers, or Paul quoting Psalm 140, verse 3, to say that the venom of asps drips from the lips of all sinners, whether Jew or Gentile. According to Luke, Jesus tells the twelve that they will tread on snakes and scorpions, an allusion to that proto-evangelium in Genesis 3. And the authors of scripture repurpose serpent or serpent-adjacent imagery such as the mythical Leviathan, the Tanim, the Rahab, and the dra dragon or dracon, 
from their broader religious context to emphasize God's superiority and victory over all adversaries and challengers. So snake language does serve a negative archetypal function in these texts. In fact, though, no creatures are actually dangerous to, despised by, or bad to God, not even venomous snakes. We read in Job and the Psalms, in concert with that reading of Genesis 1, that God provides for and delights even in particularly dangerous non-human creatures. God creates all, snakes included, in wisdom, we read in Psalm 104. Moreover, snake terms sometimes serve positive symbolic and archetypal functions in Scripture as well. Jesus, for instance, commands the disciples to be as wise as serpents, which implies both, first, snakes are wise, Jesus said it, okay, a positive characteristic, and second, that humans can and should learn from them. Now, while God sends venomous serpents in judgment of his people as they wander in the wilderness in Numbers 21, a bronze serpent on a pole is the means of their healing and deliverance. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, Jesus says, so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Which, by the way, is John 3, 14 and 15. You may have noticed the immediate context of the text of Scripture that everybody still knows in our biblically illiterate world. Uh, as an aside, I've never seen somebody hold up a sign at a football game with John 3.14 on it, where Jesus favorably compares himself to a snake. Just two verses before the most famous text in the New Testament, Jesus applies snake imagery to himself to illuminate the significance and the impact of his crucifixion. So the tension between snake positive and snake negative imagery in scripture and the metaphoric nature of much of this language invites a question. How should we think about the actual animals? This question brings me back to the Eden creation account of Genesis 2 and 3. Now I'll tell you from personal experience, I've captured literally hundreds of snakes. This is a very small sampling just from recent years of snakeys. Um, so I've done this, and though I talk to them, every single one, not a one of them has ever talked back to me, let alone tried to get me to disobey God. So that personal experience combined with my assessment of the goodness of creatures in Genesis 1 and the snake positive text in Scripture suggests to me that however we're to steward the manifold mysteries of Genesis 3, we cannot read it, at least not faithfully and responsibly, as a cosmogonic myth justifying the literal condemnation and destruction of serpents. Even the flow and particularities of the Eden account make it difficult to theologically justify any sort of hatred of actual snakes. The enmity between humans and snakes recounted in Genesis 3, in fact, is a result of or expression of the curse, not what God wants. It follows from the surd of sin and so is against the goodness of our created nature. It does not fit within the goodness of the created order God intends in Genesis 1. Moral conversion, according to Bernard Lonergan, is an experience wherein one moves from making choices and determining one's values on the basis of satisfactions and personal preferences to recognizing the pull of a transcendental good the good itself, and committing to determining our values, habits, and individual choices in accordance with that greater good, the good, in fact, that God wills for creation. Such is the shift required for one to move from the rigid, literally ignorant in the technical sense of that word, assertion, justified with snake negative text in scripture, that the only good snake is a dead snake, to recognizing that all snakes are good snakes. The snake positive text in scripture and God's clear love for God's creatures and their very particularity can invite that personal transformation. Its implications for our appreciation of and commitment to the more than human world are profound. On taking up serpents, or why did it have to be snakes? Careful listeners might recognize I have not discussed some of the most important snake positive texts in scripture. So I conclude with some eschatological reflections from two of my favorites. Whatever we're to make of the identification of Satan as the dragon and serpent in Revelation 22, 
that clearly symbolic use of snake language is not the most powerful eschatological serpent imagery in scripture. In Isaiah 11, we read, the wolf shall lie down with the lamb, the leopard shall lie down with the kid, the calf and the lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, their young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the asp, and the weaned child shall put its hand on the otter's den. They will not hurt or destroy on all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. While this tableau has rightly been recognized as a poetic and symbolic depiction of God's redemptive work in the eschaton, that recognition does not permit us to argue that because of their lower status that animals or plants or any other living things or even non-living creatures will not enjoy the benefits of God's saving work. The mystery of God's will, in fact, is that God is reconciling all things, whether things in heaven or things on earth in Christ, as Paul testifies in Ephesians 1. We might be able to say, even with boldness, that all snakes go to heaven, or at least to the new heavens and the new earth, to God's holy mountain. God keeps them in mind. God will not forget them or any of God's creatures who are groaning, awaiting the revelation of the sons and daughters of God. In a longer ending of Mark's gospel, which most likely is not original, yet nevertheless appears in most modern translations, the risen Christ commands the disciples to proclaim the good news to the whole creation. Our Lord says that signs will accompany its proclamation, including disciples picking up serpents in their hands. Both Isaiah 11 and the longer ending of Mark, in these texts we glimpse an eschatological situation where human hatred of snakes has ended. This should not be surprising, given that Christ comes out of love for the world, becomes a curse to end all curses, and brings about the end of enmity through his passion. They will not kill or steal or destroy, declares the Lord, and neither will we any longer. Taking up serpents then, and even lifting up serpents, can be a means of sharing in God's creative and eschatologically redemptive work in the world. To seek to know snakes or any other creature as God does is to contribute ever so incrementally more to filling God's world with the knowledge of God, as Isaiah testifies. Taking up the cause of serpents is a particularly poignant practice in our current time of ecological degradation and desperation, but it can also be a profound means of our spiritual transformation. To come to love them and serve them, given the ubiquity of our historic disdain for them, is arguably to love the least or lowliest of God's creatures, even literally, they're creeping on the ground. It's easier to convince people of the value and goodness of birds, given how their behavior is suggestive of human values such as freedom and ascent and beauty and light. Feathered flying creatures draw our eyes upwards to God, but God is present in the deepest depths too, and even the darkness is not dark to God. Snakes inhabit literally the liminal, shadowy recesses of the earth and metaphorically of our hearts and our minds. They remind us of our own transience, weakness of body, fearful lack of control, shame, deceit, and violence. But if we humble ourselves to descend to them, to stoop down and pick them up gently, God can and does lift our hearts and minds, transforming us to recognize and affirm more fully that all things live and move and have their being in God. And so transformed, we can seek to know them as God does, and so serve them and all creatures in the fulfillment of God's call for us to steward God's creation. So why not then practice resurrection and take up serpents now? What really makes the difference I've discovered for persons is not argument, especially not via disembodied social media, or even impassioned reason compelling lectures and sermons delivered with integrity and authenticity. We can become convinced of the value and goodness and lovableness of the more than human world best through encounter, through communion, and through the fruit of the spirit that such encounters require and facilitate, especially love and joy and peace, patience, gentleness, and self-control. 
uh, and her concluding reflections to uh, my creaturely theology course this past spring, one of my students wrote something that I will not ever forget. Uh, she wrote that the experience of holding a wild snake, a calm wild snake in her hand, gave her a sense of peace that she had never previously experienced before. And I get to experience that all the time. And you could too. What truly makes a difference is practicing habits of attention and wonder, even touch. Through these, we gain an intimacy with creatures that approximates God's own. And what better place to work at loving what God loves and to practice faith that God's perfect love drives out fear than by taking up, holding, loving the snakes. If we do, surely the change and transformation we experience will motivate and sustain us in the healing work God has called us to do, a sure sign that God is already making all things new. Thank you. All right. The title of my response is Practicing Resurrection with Nagini, the coming redemption of all creatures, great and small. All right. A few days before the Christmas holiday, Voldemort's venomous snake, Nagini, attacked Arthur Weasley while he was protecting the prophecy regarding the fate of Voldemort and Harry Potter. Interestingly, Nagini, Voldemort's personal companion and Horcrux, was once a friendly ally to wizards resisting dark magic, but evil so rooted itself in her life that she became one with the Dark Lord. What we see with Nagini's story, then, is a creature whose original goodness is twisted and warped to a point beyond recognition. Joseph Gordon has persuasively argued that snakes present us with a paradigmatic case to test our attitudes towards creation's goodness and eventual disarray. While it is common to dismiss snakes as uniquely loathsome on account of their associations with Genesis 3, Gordon calls us to see them in the context of a broader theology of creation's goodness and not with a biased predisposition toward their evil. If there's any hostility that exists between humans and snakes, Arthur Weasley's and Nagini's, it's because the enmity, he says, between human and snakes recounted in Genesis 3, in fact, is a result of or expression of the curse. I think Gordon's observations are correct. Any instance of antipathy, acrimony, or hostility experienced among creatures is attributable to something that has invaded creation and rotted out the proper order originally intended to be displayed. So my intent for this response is to supplement Gordon's picture with a bit more eschatological detail. His account is not one in which we are beckoned to return to the beginning, as if such a return after the intrusion of sin is possible. He is clear that if we're to relate rightly to all creatures, great and small, including snakes, as depicted in Isaiah 11, 8, we must be rightly calibrated to an eschatological end that promises the redemption of all things as they were intended by God. This raises the question, what role should eschatology play in calibrating our attitudes to creaturely life? Gordon sums up, summons us to practice resurrection and to take up snakes, but how exactly should eschatology inform our normative ethics? After showing that there are at least two ways that eschatology exercises normative purchase for our moral lives, I shall argue that God's commitment to what God has made should lead us to think that God's actions to bring about an eschatological end, do not eradicate creatures or their attributes, but rather only removes the sin that inheres within them. God, I conclude, is not in the business of annihilating his creation and erasing what has gone wrong. Rather, as the Anglican Collect for Ash Wednesday states, God hates nothing that God has made and is rather extracting and curing the poison of sin from within it. Now, Christian ethics arises from the observed tension that exists between the world as it is and the world as it should be. On the one hand is the world as we know it, fallible, broken by sin, infiltrated by darkness and pain, and characterized by a hostility 
which exists between creatures intended to live in harmony. In Pauline terms, the world as we know it displays a creation that groans. Conversely, divine revelation ensures and promises that the world as it is, is considerably different from the world as it should be. The world as it is, should be the world as it should be, I'm sorry, is found in a promised new heaven and earth for which creation waits in eager expectation. That promise for St. Paul is a hope, quote, that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into freedom and glory for the, of the children of God, Romans 8, 20, 21. Though creatures now groan, it is a groaning with hope, an expectation that the decay we now experience will one day be removed. The world as it is then makes it difficult to distinguish an original created goodness amidst the impact of sin. Gordon's basic claim is that snakes must be seen in precisely this light. They are good, and if our encounter with them involves harm or pain, it is attributable to a curse that impacts all of creation, not something unique to snakes. Snakes as we encounter them now are not snakes as they should be. So what must God do to bring about a world where asps no longer harm infants, where creation itself is liberated from the bondage to decay? Christian history witnesses to at least two different kinds of answers. One, on the one hand, is, is a set of views claiming that creation can be categorized according to two different types of attributes, some that image God directly and some that were established by God in the anticipation of sin. This tradition of interpretation reaches as far back as Origen, goes through to Gregory of Nyssa and Maximus the Confessor, and has many defenders in contemporary biblical studies and theology. The attributes given to us by God in the anticipation of sin are those, in the words of Gregory of Nyssa, which humans share in common with the irrational life of brutes. Those attributes that make us similar to animals were provided to us only because God knew we would sin making them a departure from the prototype, says Gregory. Our eschatological hopes, therefore, are to return to the prototype where only those attributes that image God remain. Nissen states this, we throw off every part of our irrational skin along with the removal of the garment. The answer to the question before us on this first option is that God must take away, must remove certain aspects of creation originally given as stopgaps for sin. And it's difficult to see how creation and redemption remain united on such a view, in my opinion. In order for redemption to occur, creation must give way. We cannot be sure, therefore, that our attempts to live consistently with the world as it should be are actually eschatologically guaranteed. Perhaps another kind of answer will suffice. This alternative, promoted by figures like Irenaeus and Augustine, observes no such distinction between creaturely attributes. Rather than envisioning God discarding certain elements of, of creation to redeem them, these figures depict creation as on a trajectory of growth and maturation, a trajectory that sin has disrupted. So God's action is to restore creation to its right alignment. This introduces a much higher degree of continuity between the world as it is and the world as it should be, at least in terms of the attributes that will persist into the eschaton. Part of the reason for this is Augustine's conviction that evil is a privation, making everything that exists, even snakes, substantially good. The tension between the world as it is and the world as it should be is generated by exactly one thing, sin, and not any attributes that are natural to creatureliness. So Irenaeus says this, for neither the substance nor the matter of the creation will be annihilated. True and solid is the one who established it, but the fashion of this world passes away, that is, in which the transgression took place. Augustine agrees, claiming that eschatology removes sin, not aspects of creation. An evil is eradicated, he said, not by the removal of the nature in which it has arisen or any part of it but by the healing and correction of the nature which has become vitiated and depraved. It is not by its utter destruction, however, but rather by its transmutation that this world will pass away. Redemption on this Irenaean-Augustinian account restores creation's growth 
to matur and maturation, making it not a return to the garden or to a prototype, but to a perfection of what the garden was always intended to be. And modern films like Harry Potter, a person has one of two options when faced with a snake bite. And Dr. Gordon may hasten to add that neither of these are medically suggested or medically suggested way of dealing with the snake bite. You might amputate the limb on which you were bitten, or you might attempt to suck out the venom. Again, don't do either. Approaches like Gregory of Nyssa's represent the former option. To eradicate the sin in the creature, parts of the creature must be done away with. Approaches like Irenaeus's and Augustine's represent the latter. The problem is not the limb, but the poison inhering within it. And this, is, and this is the latter vision that better situates Gordon's claim that the problem is not with snakes, but with the curse. Only with Irenaeus and Augustine can we say, without qualification, that creaturely existence is good and worth protect, protecting, because it is neither ours nor God's intent to eliminate it. With such an understanding, our eschatological imaginations can stretch themselves forward to picture a world in which creaturely goodness is retained yet without sin. And this is what drives our moral action today. Then, to the degree that we are able, measures can be taken to protect the very things God is, God is willing to keep safe until heaven and earth are made new. Thank you. Both very inspiring, very powerful words. Provocative, huh? Are you ready? Uh, I'm ready. What questions do you have? We would, uh, yeah, would you like to give a response? Just real quick. Yes, no, you real quick. yes, you may. Yes, you may. Thanks, Felipe, for, for that wonderful response. Uh, there's one thing that, um, a question that raised for me that's an ongoing question that I don't have an answer to, and that's the question of animal sin. Um, and specifically snake sin, like, right, whatever happens, uh, however we're supposed to think of what happens in the garden, uh, this this particular serpent's behavior is not uh, up, upright entirely. Um, so I, I uh, tend to think from my personal experience with snakes that they do not sin, um, that they're uh, things that we interpret as aggression and violence are in fact uh, all that they can do just to preserve their existence. Uh, you know, what happens whenever a snake shows up? You know, you know what happens whenever a snake shows up. <laughs> Somebody gets out a shovel or even worse, a gun. Um, I've seen people swerve to run, run them over. Um, so, you know, snakes, uh, snakes will defend themselves, understandably. And I also want to tell you, I didn't say this explicitly, but it is naturally good for you to want to preserve yourself as well. <laughs> I, I, I mean that wholeheartedly. Uh, I don't advocate for handling venomous snakes unless you are professionally trained and for certain purposes, uh, because that's how you get bit by a venomous snake. And I don't want that to happen to myself or to any of you. Um, all this occasions further reflections on nature and what's natural. Um, and uh, there's a footnote on this that I that I didn't state explicitly. But the way that I think about the, the one created order of creation and redemption that, that is the world that God has made and is, is transforming is by abstracting nature, not as that which is out there, but the good, intelligible order that God intends from the beginning, from sin, which is our well willed stupidity. I think it's exclusive to us, not to other uh, lower creatures. Angels is complicated. Um, and then grace. Uh, which heals the damage that sin does to nature and doesn't just restore us to growth and maturation, but transforms us from one degree of glory to another, sharing in the very life of God, which I think is not something that the goodness in its contingency of nature has from the beginning. Um, so I, I, I really appreciate the Augustinian and Irenaean approach. But I think that that uh, in modernity that that we have to think with even more nuance. So anyway, uh, don't actually go try to find a snake and pick it up right now. 
<laughs> I, I tried I tried to get permission from the state's Department of Natural Resources to catch a native snake by the river and bring it in today, uh, but it's illegal. Um, and I knew that it was, but it's sort of gray. Snake legality laws are, uh, they differ between states and, um, you know, so uh, I didn't do that. You probably are pleased with that. Um, but uh, I really had hoped I could bring one in uh, to introduce to you all. So, yeah. Thank you for that omission. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm disappointed, but you're welcome. Okay. Yes. Mary? Uh, yeah, and we'd like you to come to the microphone when you are ready to speak for those online. As the granddaughter of someone who was terrified of snakes, so much so that we could scare her saying pop beads were a snake, I found this quite intriguing. Um, but I'm in, I'm interested in, uh, in, in your application and looking at snakes and wondering how much this might relate to other animals. I mean, not all creation is named in scripture, yeah. but living in the city, I'm thinking of two uh, Dr. Edwards mentioned cockroaches. Yeah. I'm thinking of rats, both of which become out of balance because of human behavior. But I'm just wondering if this, if you, what you've done with snakes could be applied to other um, creatures as well. Thanks for asking that question. I think that it can. Um, why, why are cockroaches and rodents a problem? Uh, it's actually almost entirely because of us, uh, which is the case for all ecological disruption. So um, y'all know that we're quite good at building shelter. Uh, and most of our uh, non-human neighbors, animals, are not. There are some that do, um, but they are very happy to use what we have made. Um, and so this brings us into contact and provides a point of, I think, reflection on our relationship to them and, and their goodness. And how do we navigate all this? Uh, there's a wonderful book that was written by Bethany Brookshire. Um, she's not a Christian, um, but uh, it's on pests. Um, and it is a, uh, a really stimulating philosophical investigation of the very notion of the pest. Uh, and she explores rodents and uh, pigeons and snakes, although the snake chapter, I have to admit, I wasn't as pleased with. Uh, it, it's It's... There's still good stuff there, um, but but these serve as a test case for us. Um, they uh, they are an opportunity for us to think about our place in the world and our uh, interrelationships with all that that's around us. So again, I've noted these problems are human problems. Why do we have the the problems? Um, because of our our behavior, uh, because of waste. Like we've talked about how much food we waste. Well, why do you think the rodents are coming coming in? The cockroaches are coming in. Um, so uh, there, there are things to do to uh, address these. Um, uh, and, and again, they provide a test case for, for our own uh, convictions, our own faithfulness. So I will confess to you that I swat every mosquito that lands on my children uh, or myself, you know, uh, we have, you know, we have to avoid uh, ticks uh, in, in East Tennessee. They're not so bad and we don't have Lyme disease as much, but every tick that I find, I crush. Um, but I actually am grieved over this because um, I don't think, and God help me with this, that it's, permissible for us to think that any creature is intrinsically bad. Uh, Thank you. So, okay, please come to the microphone. Thank you for um, the information that you share with us on today. <clears throat> I also uh, heard you mention about uh, as nature and what is natural, mm -hmm. but then snakes, uh, it seemed to me, um, if I will relate a snake to a human being and you're telling me that um, if I'm gentle with the snake that I will receive a positive response, yeah. but if my spirit 
and who I am being negative, I might just get bit. Yeah. Um, so I say this in a, the first footnote of my paper. I never pick up a large or medium sized snake without expecting to get bit. Um, it doesn't hurt. Like getting bit by a pet dog or a cat is a much more significant, potentially medically problematic experience. Um, but that doesn't happen to me very often anymore because of practice uh, and gentleness. The snake, the snake can understand if its life is threatened or not. Right. Now, I'm not saying, again, nobody in here should go out with zero experience and flip rocks down by the river to try to find snakes, although that's how you would uh, find one if you if you wanted to. Um, so, uh, you know, there, 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 the, te uh, the, the, the talk is rhetorically suggestive. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, I mean, they, but they, they can be domesticated just like other animals. You know, I mentioned dogs and cats. I have a pet snake named Hermes. She's a Honduran milk snake. She's captive bred. Um, she is the sweetest, gentlest animal you could imagine. She I recognizes me. She endures being poked and prodded by hundreds of children and my uh -huh. students, and she loves it. Okay, yeah, I was just getting ready to ask, uh, do you also use your ability that you know about snakes and then also teach others? I do. As far yes. as our children, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good yeah. Um, so this, I could not get away from this work if I tried. Uh, my first teaching position was at our Florida campus. Um, which unfortunately is is closing. So pray for us if you if you think about that. But in 2015, uh, uh, I um, moved to Florida from Milwaukee, um, which was a tremendous increase in the number of snakes that I had access to and all kinds of other things. And uh, it was when I was uh, transitioning into my first full time year of teaching, finishing writing my dissertation, that book, which provides the theological approach to scripture that's in the background of this and there's four copies of it over there if you want one um i was i was doing all this work and i needed to have a a release so i went out into the wilderness and and became reacquainted with these these animals and the day that i turned my dissertation in i flew up to milwaukee to do it i was teaching on theological anthropology in intro to theology class on what human beings are and somebody came and knocked on my door, and it was one of the grounds people, and I knew exactly why, because there was they had found a snake, and it was in the um, uh, in in one of the water access panels, uh, and it was this beautiful, absolutely gorgeous uh, uh, adult female Florida water snake. Their their Latin name is Pictiventris, which means painted belly. Snake bellies are incredible. Um, I sh I showed you one um, king snake back here uh but anyway uh i i went and i got this snake um and i brought it to class and taught the rest of my class holding the snake and that was the first of five times that i've had snakes basically show up in in my classes four times in florida now once in tennessee and um snakes happen to me <laughs> when, when they when when i'm around and so, but every subsequent time that I've taught that theological anthropology section, I bring Hermes, my Honduran milk snake, and talk to my students about the different human possibilities for relating to non-human creatures. And they don't forget it. They don't forget the experience. Um, and uh, Hermes also comes with me in my theological anthropology course during Sin Week, because <laughs> you have to ask the expert, why did you do it? you know <laughs> and uh and she doesn't respond because it's not her fault uh which i think the genesis fall account actually that's its message not an explanation for the origins of sin but it, it sort of undoes itself we're the ones to blame um not not even the serpent um so but they but they come with me at the end of uh, October, I'm I'm going to bring Hermes to an event at a local state park, um, and she'll meet hundreds of trick or treating kids, and um, yeah. So, and and again, when I'm around, snakes snakes show up. So my colleagues on Johnson's campus where I teach, 
if they see me out in the wilderness and they don't like snakes, they know you better stay away because they're, they're probably going to be one. So, Please. Thanks so much for this, Joe. I'm wondering if you have any reflections on the end of Acts, um, Acts 28 and Paul yeah. getting bit. There's a, I think there's a lot going on with that story in oh, terms of what's sort of, and especially the, the, the Islanders reaction, like, oh, this man must be a god. So any reflections you have on yeah. that? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, you get into the uh, ancient Near Eastern and Greco-Roman associations with serpent symbolism. One thing I didn't note, but is in a footnote, is uh, uh, James Charlesworth, uh, has written an incredible book, uh, The Good and Evil Serpent, uh, in which he leaves no stone, almost literally unturned, in exploring ancient Near Eastern and Greco-Roman serpent imagery. And uh, he comes up with 29 positive associations of serpent imagery in the ancient world and 16 negative ones. And this this notion that that uh, one having power over a snake would, would make them divine, I mean, that's just sort of part of the fabric of, of, of a lot of ancient conceptions. Um, it's present in the, the uh, Moses narrative whenever he, with the staff in Exodus. Um, and uh, you get all this really rich imagery. The Acts text is super weird uh, for a lot of reasons. One of them is that uh, there have at least two uh, geologist studies and herpetologist studies, there have never been recorded venomous snakes in population on Malta, uh, but there is an island off the coast of Greece that has a population of venomous horn vipers, and that could be textually what Luke is referring to. Um, but uh, it's just a, it's just weird. Like it's one of the few times in Scripture where snake language is used, and there's an actual snake present. Um, so. I don't I don't know what to I don't know what to do with it. I don't know if Paul got bit by a venomous snake on this other island that's not Malta and then you know didn't experience effects um supernaturally or if he got a dry bite which is actually very common for venomous snakes. They don't want to waste their venom on us because we're not edible to them. Um and a bite is always a warning for any snake whether it's venomous or non-venomous. Um and uh, so they will they will bite without envenoming, and that could have been what happened, or supernatural, or the people didn't know that there were no venomous snakes on the island, and ancient people often assumed that every snake was venomous, and that's what's going on. Um, you know, there's there's all manner of possible ways of understanding that. So, yeah, I'm not sure what to do with it. I will have to write more about it eventually, but it's a good question. Thank you. Please feel free to come to the microphone. Thank you for adding to our vocabulary too, uh, Dr. Gordon. Envenomating is a word I want to try to use yeah. in my teaching. There are very few snakes that are poisonous. Poison in, is ingested. Venom is injected. Um, so when you're afraid of poisonous snakes, you're not afraid of poisonous snakes. You're not going to eat a garter snake that's been eating venomous newts and is poisonous because of that. You're afraid of getting bit by a copperhead or a rattlesnake. That's envenomation. Um, so, yeah. Thank you. Try to speak. Yeah, thank you for your presentation, both of you. It's really, I was really interested, uh, very intriguing. I was wondering if you could expound on uh, Numbers 21 and maybe connect it to the problem of suffering and how God redeems the the, the thing that was making them suffer yeah. and actually uses that to provide their healing as well. Yeah, um, that's a great, great question. Numbers 21 is also a super strange text. Uh, and then it, it shows up again in the in the canon and in, in, um, uh, in Kings, whenever people are worshiping the the uh, serpent staff, the Nechustan, and and then again in, in um in Jesus talking to Nicodemus in John three, um, yeah, I think that that's a uh, it's just a powerful image. Um, how does God save us? How does God relieve our suffering? How does God bring about um, relief through the very image that that caused things in the first place? Uh, and this has profound Christological implications, implications for how we think about the atonement. Um, we experience the curse, we experience enmity, 
we sin against God, against ourselves, and against one another. Uh, and so how does God redeem us? Um, not by crushing those things, but by going straight through them in Christ's work. Uh, by suffering, our healing comes about through Christ's suffering. Uh, our liberation from sin comes about from him becoming a curse, becoming sin, even Paul writes. Uh, our, our liberation comes from death through death. Um, right, death is not a surprise to God. I mean, this, this is something that we really have to learn now. Right, some of our sisters and brothers know this because they've not been privileged to try to resist it and deny it. But those of us who resist it and deny it need to recognize uh, that we'll die. Um, and uh, And we know this because uh, death is even the means of our healing, the means of our uh, freedom from suffering, the means of our salvation. Uh, so it's profound, rich imagery. Um, you know, uh, it communicates, uh, it moves. So, but it's also s symbolic imagery, and like again, like trying to navigate this 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 very ancient Near Eastern, very different from a modern Western perspective kind of event. It's just a, it's just challenging for us. So I will write a lot more about Numbers 21 too. Um, now I don't know all the things that I'll say uh, whenever I do that, but um, yeah, it's, uh, it's fascinating. How many times snakes show up in strange places in scripture? So. Joe, thank you so much. Um, it's my experience that as a biblical scholar that a lot of theologians have a denigrated view of the created order. Yeah. So I want to take your creation um, yeah. theology class. Yeah. What, what did you call it? Creature Creature theology. theology. I want to take yeah. that class. Can I join you? I would love to have okay. you. Yeah. So, Come um, on down. East Tennessee is beautiful. So I have, a, I have a couple of questions. One is maybe a simple question, and the other is a big theological question that's really for you and for Philippe on the question of Augustine and Irenaeus. But let me do a simple question first. You had Isaiah 11, right? Mm -hmm. Humans and snakes in harmony. But Isaiah 65 in that same spot has the snake is going to keep eating dust. Yeah. Which seems to be a reference back to Genesis, Genesis 3. Genesis 3, yeah. What do you make of the, the curse on the snake in Genesis 3? What do you think that refers to chronologically? Yeah, I don't know. Again, Genesis 3 is super weird too. Yeah. Um, I mean, the curses are etiological. Yeah, I think that that's clear. There's really only two curses, right? Curse on the on the Adama, the ground, and yeah. curse on the snake. There's no curse on people. No curse on people. There's consequences. Right. Consequences, yeah. Um, but they're eti it's etiological for yeah, the yeah. snake, right? Uh, it's it loses its limbs. So, but it doesn't ever. There's not an actual definitive clear suggestion that the snake is does have limbs. No, right, Although right, right, a, right. It is named a beast. Of the field it's not named a creeping right. thing in, in genesis 3. but but genesis 2 has a different categorization of animals it does from, uh, yeah yeah and in fact the the category of livestock or cattle right behema yeah it does not occur in god's creation of animals in genesis 2. it's only when the man names Domestic the animals yeah. that category comes into being because that's a domesticated mm -hmm. animal so the naming domesticates some animals but the snake remains wild remains, that's the yeah. way i read that yeah. text yeah um so I was I was wondering about if if the curse on this snake is just a etiological thing that there will be wild animals and humans that won't get along that won't get along yeah, yeah. because the, although the tr the later translation has crush and strike the, the Hebrew has the same verb it's just yeah. it's a on par yeah I was wondering about that um, yeah well I think that that makes sense as etiology too for the okay. enmity that's between humans and mm -hmm. and uh, uh, the wild beasts. Um, so I, I confess that I'm not sure what to, to yeah. do with the, I mean, they, they seem, it seems to me to be folkloric. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so limblessness is actually not a curse for snakes. Right, right, right. It's the means of their survival. Yeah, yeah. Um, and they are really good at it. Like this, the, the, like it actually neurologically triggers people to see a snake slither because it doesn't have limbs. How can it do that? Um, but it's how they it's how they do their snaking, okay. right? And they don't actually eat dust, right? Um, right. Either uh, so, 
Yeah, I mean, uh, it seems it seems to be to me that that aspect of the narrative, the curses of the land and the serpent, and then the consequences for humanity, is etiological. It functions mm-hmm. etiologically, mm-hmm. but the whole rest of it, I think, is anti ancient Near Eastern mythology. Yes, yes, I agree. So that's that's how I navigate navigate that. If somebody else wants to ask a question, I can hold off my theological question um, for a while. No. <laughs> well, my theological question is to both of you on this question of Irenaeus and Augustine. So you seem to, to, to object a little bit to the reference to the Augustine Irenaeus stuff, right? I no, would, I wouldn't say I object. Sure. I just, I would have a, a modified perspective yeah, of the, what okay, the restoration of progress right. means. And I'm not sure that Felipe would just, I don't know what his perspective would be on but, that. So my question is actually more foundational because I see a fundamental difference between Irenaeus and Augustine. Eschatologically, yeah. because yeah. Augustine, for example, has the the redemption of, um, the, of the social order, for mm-hmm. example, in the city of God, but he has no heaven and no new heaven and new earth. There is no concrete physical manifestation in the eschaton yeah. that I can find, whereas Irenaeus seems to imply there is. But then uh, my my problem is having been a student of Plotinus and seeing where Provatia Boni comes in. And studying Augustine and writing papers on Augustine, provided Boni, I see that the paradox of that notion is on the one hand to say, yes, materiality is not evil. So it's, a, it's against Gnosticism. But Provatia Boni and Augustine, I can give you quotes from Augustine in the liberal arbitrio on this question, where he says, the physical order is not deficient for not being God, but it is of a lower good than God which means he's just taken back the statement he just made. Provatia boni means finitude is not infinite, therefore it is limited, therefore it is not the full God, full good, it is a limited good. And, and that, that comparison, one ought to say, the good creation is simply good. I agree. It, it's not judged by being not God. So I find problematics there. And I wonder if you want either one to co- comment on that. Yeah. Um... I heard two questions, one on Augustine and eschatological materiality, and then one on Pravatia Boni. Uh, So I don't know anything about snakes. I work on gender. (laughs) (laughs) But here's one concrete example of where Augustine seems to clearly affirm a material eschatology in contradistinction to the mainstream thought of his day would be on the resurrection of sexed bodies. he even against his teacher Ambrose would say in the end of City of God that it is no fault for a woman to be a woman, right? And mm-hmm. God is not in the business of eradicating things that are not faults, right? So with Gregory, with Origen, with uh, Ambrose, he's basically saying, hey, listen, you have this wrong understanding of death and resurrection. And in fact, we will be resurrected materially with the sex bodies that we have. And for him, that has implications for social order and things like that, which we can talk about if you want. So I, I do see a pretty real, I mean, what he, he'll say is there's no politics because politics is necessary for sin to keep us from right, killing right, each other, right? right? right. Mm-hmm. Um, there's no private property because that's also, uh, but I'm like, you know, I don't need those things if I'm with God, you know, I don't know. <laughs> right. So but, but yeah. at this point, I, I acknowledge he has yeah. a resurrection of the body, yeah. but he doesn't have a new creation in which the body is, the, the body is in an immaterial heaven. What other place would a body be in? It'd be in a new, new earth. And in fact, you can find oh, a new heaven, a new heaven, a new earth, which means a yeah. new cosmos. Yeah. He doesn't have that. He has. He does not ha- have that view of the eschaton. So and you're saying he has a new, he- a new earth, but not a new heaven? No, he doesn't have a new earth either. I but don't where, would, that... where would human bodies be if not? Well, that's right. That's a yeah. logic. So I'm saying there's, yeah. a, there's something not logical about his view uh, okay. of the eschaton. Because he doesn't have a new earth, but he has a resurrected body. In fact, this is a paradox through much of the later medieval tradition yeah. also. But um, you have individual thinkers who have a, a, um, a new body in a new creation, which yeah. is a logical thing you need, right? So th- this strikes me as a hermeneutics of Augustine question, right? Why couldn't we assume that if he's affirming the persistence of a physical body, that he's also affirming the persistence okay, well, of a physical body? We can get into order. that, but I, yeah, yeah uh, that's, that's a different question. Yeah. Okay. okay, yeah. yeah. But thank and, you. Yeah, the, the Pravatia Boni stuff, I would just say, like, when I read Augustine on the Librio, uh, the, the, 
the stream of the Latin, I'm not going to get the Latin right now. Um, early work that he mm. will say he doesn't deny later on, but he definitely does. You know? I know, I know, yeah, yeah. 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 He tracks you on it. He yeah. claims he doesn't yeah. really take much back, but he takes quite a bit back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I think, yeah, anyway, that's okay. Did you want to? Yeah. Um, so the the question about the about Provazio Boni, for me, uh, I I address it with this uh, tripartite abstraction. Mm -hmm, so right. the created and redeemed order of the economic work of God is one. Um, but I think we need to distinguish between nature and its goodness. And but it's not God. No, mm -hmm. Nothing of uh, of the natural order or of sin or of grace is God. The the fundamental distinction first is between creator and creation. Uh, so its goodness is uh, in its contingency. Its contingency does make possible sin, and sin is not just possible but is ubiquitous. Mm -hmm. um, but to a certain extent. Uh, I want to insist on, uh, on on stating emphatically that sin is without being intelligible, right, right. as opposed to creation, which is right. and is intelligible, right. and creatures are and are intelligible, right. um, and that is good. Right. We can say though that sin is parasitic on the good without yes. using the particular metaphysics of Prato Boni. That's what. Yeah. That's the issue I would be getting into. Well, yeah. Joe, can I ask you a clarifying question yeah. about that? Uh, would you say that glorified humans are something more than natural? Yes. Yeah. I would. I so would. I think that's where explicitly use yeah. the language supernatural. supernatural. Yeah, I yeah. think that's what, So yeah, I think that's where we definitely we have different. I, I would differ there too. Yeah. I'm, I'm with you on that. Because yeah. <laughs> I don't think you need that language. That language has too much yeah. baggage. But there's ways to get at what you're trying to say without that conceptuality. Well, uh, I don't have any of the bad baggage with it. Just, yeah, I, don't, you, I don't bring but that. It, sometimes along. it just comes along. I know. <laughs> would you say that? The, uh, would you also say me. that but, but, uh, the intrusion of sin is a removal of a gift that leaves us as merely natural as well? No. Okay. So it's not quite a full nature grace distinction. No, it is a full nature grace distinction. Okay. <laughs> All, right. Uh, All right. Yeah. It's, Lon it's Lonergan's approach to these issues, yeah. which is not. Yeah is not easily mappable onto the debates in the 20th century. I, th I think he gets it right. Okay. Um, it's not De Lubac, mm -hmm. um, and it's not the, it's not the two-tiered Thomism. Did, did anything happen to our natures once sin entered the picture? No. Okay. What, what happens is a change in history. Okay. Yeah, I think that, yeah, you and I would definitely differ on that, yeah. Yeah. Thank you, guys. But that's fun. That's good. Fair enough. Uh, I did want to say one thing about this image. Um, so this is this is the most special thing that a student has ever given to me. Uh, I mentioned snakes showing up to class. Uh, one day I went to my outdoor classroom storage room uh, to get my supplies. I have a movable whiteboard and, and rack of chairs. And as I was coming out, I looked down on the floor and there was a, a dead baby water snake. Uh, so in the fall, snakes disperse. Uh, eggs hatch and uh, live bearing snakes give birth and those snakes have to find a place and they find their way into buildings on campus it actually happens regularly and uh, so this snake is is dead uh, in front of me and this is the beginning of my class experience and we were talking about our re relationship to and responsibility towards the more than human world it was it was that week in god and the human person and so i brought this dead snake and had it in my hands and taught the whole entire class with it. Um, and I just kept thinking about Jesus uh, and the sparrows. Mm. No sparrow will fall apart from God's knowledge. Uh, nothing in God's creation, in God's good creation, is forgotten to or trivial to God. And this is how the, the student interpreted that. Uh, clearly uh, crucified but resurrected Christ with healed wounds. And a very alive, alert uh, baby water snake. Yes, yes. We have time for maybe one. Uh, yes. Storytelling. Yeah. Story. Story. Okay.
one of the uh, older guys in the church, he said, if you take a stake, you know how it says, the curse, and then you'll, you'll crawl to the wall. Two questions come out of this. One is dragon. Does that mean like a snake? Yeah. But the other thing, let me finish the story. He told me, if you take a snake, when it's dead, you set it on fire, it would pop out. Let me finish this. Yeah. At the Museum of uh, Natural History, a few years ago, went down to one end and another, it's almost like on a board, about as big as one of those sections there. Yeah. They had a snake. The legs were on it. Yep. Nagash, yeah. So with a small or snake like that, would the same thing? Nope. It has to be an adult. Uh, no. Uh, so boas and pythons uh, have vestigial legs. Uh, they're spurs that have been repurposed for reproduction. Uh, no other, no other currently existing snake taxa have legs. Um, so snakes are tetrapods. You know what tetrapod means? Four-legged, but doesn't make sense for for the snake. So limblessness is, and whales too. Yeah. Whales are also tetrapods, so they have vestigial pelvis. Um, so yeah, limblessness is actually an incredibly effective means of survival and adaptation. In squamate reptiles, it's, it's, uh, there's like 30 or 40 different genera. Uh, most all lizards and then all, all modern snakes. Um, so, but no, fire will not bring out hidden legs that are inside. Yeah, boas and pythons, they have they have spurs. They have back legs. They're extremely reduced. They're not functional for locomotion or anything. Yeah. Well, let's uh, thank Dr. Gordon and Dr. Navarro.